Hey everyone, my name is Matt Klein, uh, Envoy Maintainer. I've got Alyssa Wilk here, also Envoy Maintainer. Um, we don't have any slides or anything like that. I can give a little short project update if people are interested, but mostly just um, gonna do an open Q&A. So if there's any questions, we can cover anything that people would like to cover and we'll get the mic passed around. Um, so I guess it's honestly, it's really up to all of you. Do you want to just jump straight to open Q&A or would you like to hear a, a, a short update? Small room, so you can just call out. Okay, let's see, story. Um, it, well, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been at KubeCon, so that's the first part of the story. It's been three years. Um, so it's fun to, to see all the changes and I think Envoy has matured a lot in the last few years. Um, the project is very widely used at this point and as I mentioned at, at EnvoyCon I think has become kind of boring which is a good thing. <laughs> um, so you know I think the project now is um, there's less new um, shiny feature development and you know we're spending a lot more time just on the nuts and bolts in terms of security, um, fuzzing, software supply chain, um, really just making sure that the project is stable you know for, for all the people who are using it. Um, some of the major things over the last year or so um, are investments in Quick and HTTP3. That's now generally available. So, um, you know, please check that out. Um, <clears throat> I already mentioned security and software supply chain. Um, there's other talks and people at this conference talking about Envoy Gateway. So that's our new ingress project. That's not about Envoy proxy specifically, um, but that's a ingress controller project built on top of Envoy um, that we hope will make it simpler for people to onboard onto using Envoy for Kubernetes ingress cases. Um, a lot of work has been happening with Envoy Mobile. So, um, you know, Lyft is now using that as its mobile library. Google is heavily invested. We have other folks from, from different places also who are starting to use it. So that's been fantastic. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure I'm forgetting things, but, you know, it's a, it's a perpetual motion of PRs and features, you know, across all the different protocols that Envoy supports, whether that be Redis or Dubbo or various things. And I guess the final thing that I would mention is uh, we continue to put a lot of work into the build system. So CI release, it's been a long standing request that we ship um, things other than Docker images. So I think finally in the next couple of months, we're going to have packages for different operating systems, so RPMs and DEBs and all of those things. So hopefully that will make folks happy. Um, and then <clears throat> a lot of work continues on documentation and examples. Um, Envoy for better or worse is a, a very complex piece of software and it's it's hard to make every constituency happy <laughs> in terms of the documentation and the examples and all those things. So trying to make that better where we can, you know, to help people out. Um, I think, you know, that about covers the general state of things and over, um, you know, the next period of time, I think work will just continue on all of these axes. So, um, you know, I don't think there's any major new shiny thing happening. People are still working on WebAssembly. People, we see a continuous number of, um, you know, PRs coming in on various um, security filters, whether that be OAuth or, you know, JOT or external authorization or external processing or all those things. So those are also, um, you know, things that are popular. I don't know, anything, Alyssa, that you would like to add? No, okay. Um, so that's, you know, that's really all I had and um, we're happy to answer any questions that anyone would have. So please ask us anything, happy to explain concepts or if there's, um, you know, any problems that people wanna talk through, happy to do that. So happy to pass the microphone around if there's anyone that wants to start out. Thanks. Um, as somebody who's new to the to the project in the space and just trying to start to get engaged a little bit, um, 
Is there? I know you went over kind of what's going on, but do you guys have a roadmap or areas that you'd like to see investment in? Like, how can we engage with the with the community and and bring forward hopefully resources to help? Sure. Thank you. Great question. Um, we we get that question pretty often. Is do we have a roadmap? And um, the answer is no. <laughs> And let me explain why. Um, I, I think Envoy is a bit of an oddity in this ecosystem in the fact that um, we're not backed by a vendor. <laughs> it's like we, we really are a truly community-led uh, project, you know. And it's very widely used, of course, among lots of vendors and cloud providers and lots of large internet companies and all of those things. But the features and the bug fixes and all of the things that we have coming in they're really based on the community and what they want to work on. So like we don't have a product manager um, and you know, I can give you a sense at any given time just by watching the project in terms of what things people are working on, but there's no, there's no roadmap. Like I can't tell you what we're going to do over the next couple of years. I would say it's much more like Linux in that respect. A lot of work happens. Um, none of it is, um, you know, I would say particularly, like no individual thing is particularly noteworthy, but in aggregate, you know, it, it, it keeps the ship running. Um, so to answer your question in terms of how people can get engaged, what I would say is um, I think there's a misperception that in order to help with Envoy, you know, you have to be like a networking guru or uh, like a C++ guru or something along those lines. Um, we actually need the most work and the most help with doing release management, backports, helping with our CI system. Um, you know, a lot of that is like Bazel and Python and Bash scripts and all of those things, like typical DevOps type, type stuff. Um, we always want to improve our documentation. As I was mentioning previously, um, I've always found it funny with Envoy that, um, you know, on any given week or day, I will hear from people that Envoy has, you know, like the best documentation of any open source project that I've ever seen. And then that like Envoy is the most awful piece of software that is the most poorly documented thing that I've ever seen. So I'm just saying, it's like, you can't make everyone happy, right? And we, we do the best that we can. And I think we care about documentation. But what I always encourage people is, as you're ramping up on things, if you were confused by the documentation and then you had to figure something out, please fix the documentation. <laughs> like that's a, that's a, it's a pretty low friction way to get involved in open source. And I would say from the maintainers, um, we appreciate that very much, right? And that can range from small fixes, typos, to clarifications, to more cross-linking, to now um, we have a maintainer named Ryan who's done a, I mean, he doesn't do C++ or Envoy or like networking. Like literally all he does is like work on examples and documentation and build tooling. And he's done like amazing work. And now we have, I mean, I think we have 30 sandboxes, you know, with Docker Compose that illustrate different features and all those kinds of things. So, you know, I mean, like making a new sandbox that demonstrates some feature that you struggle to, to make work is super useful. Um, so th those are the ways that I would say to, to get involved and they typically don't require that much effort. Of course, if there's features that are missing, you know, and you, and you or your team want to help add them, we'll work with you, you know, to help design them and give you tips and all of those things. I think the community is very welcoming, whether it be on GitHub or, or Slack or anything. So, um, you know, hopefully that answers your question, but I would say there's, there's plenty of ways to get involved that aren't super time consuming. Did you want to add anything, Alyssa? Yeah, I'd say the, the one other thing, if you don't have a particular agenda, something that your company needs to be done, but you want to get involved in the project, um, if you look at the open issues, you know, there's a lot tagged with help wanted and some that are specifically tagged with beginner that are things we thought would be kind of easy hello world starter projects, but actually like if we tagged it, it's, it's worth doing. Like we would love the help there. Yeah, and I mean, even even other things like, you know, we, we have fuzzers that run continuously on the open source fuzzing engine. And 
you know, there's a lot of false positives on there because writing fuzzers is hard. That's a whole separate conversation. Um, and honestly, we need people to come in and just fix bugs. I mean, it's like there's there's tons of ways to, to contribute. So I would say, you know, peek through some of the issues and always, um, I'm, I try to make, my, make myself very accessible, so you can always email me or contact me on Slack or whatever. I'm actually happy to meet with you and your organization to talk about how you can contribute. So it's any, any number of ways. You mentioned about mobile. Can you say something? And what's what? What are the challenges? Uh, what features? What's uh, not the roadmap, but what do you expect uh, the outcome to be? Um, so Envoy Mobile was a project started a few years ago, and um, I mean, essentially at a very high level, it's. You know, we have all of this code that runs on mobile clients, lots of apps, right, that run on iOS and Android. And when you think about it, you know, a lot of us at this conference, we are server engineers. Um, and historically, I think there's a lot of silo between a quote server engineer and a quote client engineer that I personally think is counterproductive because we're trying to develop a product. At the end of the day, the product that people use is the thing on the phone or on the web page. And um, a lot of times, you know, that doesn't work for a variety of reasons. So you can think that, you know, the server is returning a good success rate, but it's broken on the client for, for any number of reasons. So most of the problems that you face on the client from a networking perspective are the same on server. You know, you're doing load balancing and observability and a bunch of other things. Um, so for a long time, Google has had a networking library called Cronet. Um, so it's part of the Chrome networking stack, and that's you know, something that they've used and other companies have used for a long time. And a few years ago, um, with so much investment in Envoy, um, we thought that we could run Envoy on the mobile client, on iOS and Android, and get many of the same benefits of Envoy in terms of observability and all of the other features. Um, and um, so that's work that's been ongoing for quite some time. Um, and, and, you know, part of that, again, is a feature set. It's also the fact that there's so much effort and um, people hours that are going into working on Envoy, like hundreds and thousands of people hours and years that have gone into working on Envoy at, at this point, that, um, you know, having a single code base that is open source, there's a lot of benefits in terms of understanding what that actually looks like. But I'm going to let Alyssa answer more because she actually works on this full time now. Yeah, so again, as, as Matt said, kind of getting the modern protocols was is key for networking libraries. So if you have any kind of late sensitivity or quality of experience tied to revenue, uh, doing that bundling gets you kind of the, the latest and greatest of HTTP2 and HTTP3. Um, which in our experience, just the quality of experience improvement is, is huge. Um, the other thing we're really excited about is, is being able to, to have Envoy end-to-end, -end, right? As Matt said, the observability, but, but again, you know, I, my background was launching these modern internet protocols and doing HTTP2 end-to-end -end with like Chrome and our, our bespoke proxy and then HTTP3 end-to-end -end, and, and being able to rapid iterate on, you know, be it your new compression algorithm or new business logic or like have Wasm and iterate on Wasm and then kind of cut your build at a certain point, I think is, is really, really powerful. Um, and so again, we're focused on mobile right now, but also again, Envoy is a client stack can go beyond mobile. So if you have any sort of kind of remote devices, internet of things, you know, you can kind of fetch Wasm via XDS and install your local application and do that all with, with kind of the Envoy mobile, the Envoy client stack. So um, we're mobile focused today, but, but I think again, having the observability, the pluggability, and the modern networking stack of Envoy end-to-end -end is, is really powerful. Um, so for Roadmap, again, we do have a Roadmap for Envoy Mobile because we've been pretty tightly coordinating with Lyft on, on what we've been doing. So, um, and there, there is a talk that'll probably be online that JP uh, from Lyft gave, kind of talking through what they've done, but they're fully deployed with two carve-outs. One's uh, VPNs, which is getting turned up this quarter, and then the other one is proxy support, which uh, they're doing experiments in Android, and then we're rolling out iOS this quarter. So as of end of Q4, um, this should be like fully drop-in replacement for, uh, for that networking stack. And then uh, we're now pivoting to focusing on binary size, because to roll out, we want it to be as, as small as possible. Um, and then there's a bunch of other latency enhancements in terms of like um, 
kind of DNS HBS records that, that get you like a, a little tiny bit extra HTTP3, um, doing a little better, better job with HTTP prefetching. So we've got a list and we've been pretty transparent about what we're working on when. Um, so again, if you're curious, you're welcome to drop by. We've got a weekly um, community call on Zoom, which is on the Envoy calendar. So feel free to uh, drop in or hit us up on Slack if you have any other questions. Next question. You mentioned there's a part of the, like, not roadmap, but the planned work is CLCA, CLCA compliance. It's a, a soft, software supply chain for a soft, software artifacts. And uh, what's the effort there? Uh, what does it take to make Envoy compliant? And which uh, level do you target? Um, yeah, so software supply chain. Um, I mean, obviously, this is a big industry problem right now. I mean, I think it's great that it's getting a lot more awareness. Um, Envoy in some ways, ironically, because it is C++ has, I think, less software supply chain issues than some other ecosystems. Again, ironically, because it's so much more difficult to actually integrate dependencies than in other languages. So yay. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we have less problems in some ways, but we have the same problems in the sense that, you know, Envoy, even though we've done, again, not me, but we have great people that have spent a lot of time developing tooling in CI um, to, you know, list out all of our dependencies and check them with SHAs. And I mean, it's like, it's a lot of work has gone into this. And I don't know the current number, but Envoy, to, maybe you know, but it's like, I mean, it's easily 50 or 60 transitive dependencies that Envoy depends on, you know, and that's obviously across the entire code base in terms of like test and different extensions and whatever. But I'm sure the core code that everyone uses probably depends on like 10 or 20 different dependencies and those are, and those are different libraries. And the, the problem that we have is that um, in, from the Envoy side, we take security really seriously. I mean, we have to. Envoy is run a lot of places and people that run it, you know, want it to be a secure piece of software. Um, and... <laughs> If we take the security really seriously, but the dependencies don't take it very seriously, it kind of defeats the entire purpose, right? I mean, that, 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 that's the problem. So um, there are certain dependencies that we have that are more critical than others. So for example, the HTTP parsers are very critical from a security perspective. And historically, um, Envoy you know, used um, the HTTP parser from Joyent, which, which like is deprecated <laughs> and then we've used ngHttp2 where the maintainer of that library like refuses to work with us on any security process so yeah I mean it's it's not safe from a supply chain perspective um, so that's one area where you know Google has been investing a tremendous amount of time and basically getting us off of those libraries so it's it's honestly, it's subjective, right? And it's like we have a scorecard that we apply um, to all of the, all the dependencies that runs in an automated way. So it looks for things like how many you know PRs had approvals or code reviews or like do they have a security release process and all of those things. But it's a really imperfect process because you're 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 kind of like you're weighing, do you rewrite something which has its own risks, you know, or do you depend on this library where you could get zero date because they have no security process? So it's a, it's a very difficult problem, which I don't think we have an, there's no, there's no like black or white answer to this. Um, so it's like, what I would say is that, you know, this is another area of contribution, you know, where the tooling around this to help visibility, to identify low performing dependencies and potentially replace them is important. And or some dependencies, they themselves, this is open source, they need maintainers, right? <laughs> so, I mean, actually identifying some of the dependencies, you know, that also need maintainers and code reviews and all of those kinds of things, um, you know, that's, that's an area of like general contribution. And that's kind of what I was saying before is that, um, none of these things, you know, it's like the tech press it's not going to write about any of this stuff. This is like just the boring nuts and bolts of a highly used piece of software, um, but it's very critical. So, yeah. Did, 
Did you have anything to add? Uh, was that? No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if we were to add some new protocols on top of Envoy, how could we work with uh, the contributors and your team? Because on our own, we may not be able to do all the work. We need better understanding. Um, sorry, so I guess is the question that you need help doing the development or you want it to be upstreamed and you want to know what, what that process would look like? What that process would look like, yeah. Yeah, um, so I guess this is another general topic that I don't even know the current number, but Envoy is like a million lines of code now, I mean, which is like incredible to me. Um, and that's including, you know, all the tests and the extensions and everything else. I mean, it's, it's a pretty large code base. And that obviously causes issues for us in terms of CI costs and speed and a bunch of other things. So the, the reason that I'm saying this is that um, there's a difficult tension between, you know, Envoy is a powerful and extensible piece of software, and we want it to be used in as many cases as possible. Um, but at the same time, the more code that we bring upstream, um, there's burden on the maintainers to, to keep it building and stuff like that. Because unlike a project like Linux, which does not build all of the software on a regular basis that's in the tree, we do currently build and test all the software that's in the tree. So every software that's added is tested, you know, and like verified, which I think is a good thing, but it has cost. So the reason that I'm bringing that up is that um, depending on the protocol, you know, if it's a, it's like a one-off thing for your company, I don't know what we're talking about, right? But if it's a thing that no one's gonna use other than, than you or your company, you know, we're less likely to want to bring it upstream. So what I would say first is, you know, probably open an issue and, and have the conversation around what that looks like. We do also have something called contrib at this point. So there's two portions of the Envoy code base. There's like the main code base and then there's contrib um, just for like less vetted contributions. And we put that there um, to help get more contributions in, but they have less CI costs and they have less vetting. Like they're not tested as much. Um, and they're not put into the main Docker images. They're put into a secondary set of images. So um, I would say, you know, start by, start by opening the issue and having that conversation. The, the other side of this issue is um, Envoy today still does not do dynamic loading of extensions. This has been an issue that's been open for seven years. Um, there are pros and cons to static compilation versus dynamic loading. Um, the project is not opposed to dynamic loading, but again, there are pros and cons. So I'm just trying to give you like the general picture of what we're looking at right now. So I think we are open to other protocols, um, but there's costs. So it probably depends on how widely used that protocol is, you know, and whether it should live in tree or, or as some separate extension. Um, obviously, Lua is an option for some extensibility. WebAssembly is an option for some extensibility. I believe soon in the next few months, there will be um, a Go extension model also, where it's not tiny Go, it's not WebAssembly, it's like full Go that will run via C Go. Um, there have been companies actually that have for years done this. Um, they've run Go extensions within Envoy, but none of them have been upstreamed. So, um, I, I, and there is a company in China, I think Ant Financial, who wants to upstream that. Um, that, that would be another avenue, for example, of like getting some of that extensibility in there, but it probably depends on, on, on the use case. Yeah. Anybody have a question? Any other questions? This is maybe a little really inside baseball, but um, I have yet to figure out what virtual listeners let us do that we could not do previously. Could you unpack that a bit? Is that maybe too much? 
No, no, no. Virtual listeners? It's like a very new thing just landed. It was internal listeners. Is that it? Oh, oh fantastic. Yeah. All right. So, well, um, the internal listener is used for uh, some use case that Envoy want to talk or Envoy internally want to talk to the same Envoy instance to save the cost of networking costs. It's really uh, for some use cases that you just want to plug the uh, Envoy upstream to an uh, Envoy like listener. Like that, those uh, those can happen within Envoy instead of going through all the local ne network, local host network stuff, and that saves you some uh, save you some uh, cost in in terms of all the, all the network stack, uh, pr providing faster, and you can plumbing those like all the listener side filters in, into another like upstream that use in some in some use case like you'd want to do the tunneling stuff. Uh, that help in that performance. Uh, Alisa, do you want to add something? So it's, it's not that there's a lot extra that you can do, but the canonical example for internal listeners is imagine you have um, HTTP traffic that's encapsulated in Connect. So if you're not familiar with Connect, you have your kind of Connect, Google.com, um, and then inside of that, the, the payload of that is another HTTP request, and you want to process that. So the way to do that in Envoy is you literally do three passes in Envoy. You do one to strip off the connect headers, and then you'd like forward it to loop back, and then you do another one to process that internal payload, and then you might have to do one more pass to re-encapsulate, right? And so as Lizan said, it's a, it's a big performance optimization to not have to go through loopback. But the other addition, um, yeah, and, and again, there, there's shortcuts you can do if you're like a power user to not do three full passes, but you know, if you're doing HTTP2 connect, like you, you really can't bypass that. Like you have to like demux and then decapsulate and then forward it through another pass. Um, the other nice thing about doing the internal listener is you can actually then not just pass that payload, but also pass metadata about the original request, about like the original destination IP, or you know, if you did like PZF sniffing or anything that you you've done kind of inspection on that original connection, you can pass that um, as metadata, you know, essentially for that and have it go all the way through to the end. So that, that can be helpful kind of additional data. You would, yeah, you, you, you could have maybe attached it through a bunch of hacks, but it's just way easier to just literally pass the data structures through. So that's like the real win, I think. Any more questions? <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so, security-related question. Curious, um, when you load a certificate into Envoy, and you've got a private key associated with that, obviously, how how is that being protected or stored? Or just in general, I'm curious to understand the thoughts around that and where you might be going, if anywhere. Um, by default, the private keys are stored in RAM, so you know. I mean, it's it's pretty typical for most for most similar systems. Um, Envoy does already today support offload engines for signing, um, so it supports hardware hardware security modules and those types of things. I actually don't know off the top of my head what is in tree. Do you know, Lizen? Is there anything actually like in tree for HS HSM? Or is it all people that have done external integrations? Okay, so it is it is possible today without any core code changes to use an HSM, but we don't ship in open source any um, HSM implementations. But there are people that are using Envoy with HSMs today. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I was going to ask about uh, debugging issues with Envoy. I found it a bit painful at times, having to go to debug logs or trace even. Like I sent an email to, today to the to the users list. Uh, we have at the scale like connectivity issues to upstream when we're having a lot of connections, but then it, the log doesn't say anything else. Just cannot connect, and and there's. Issues like this uh, that I don't know if like increasing some level, some logs to a higher level would be helpful for people to to not having to 
don't know. It, it involves changing the log levels, looking at the logs. It's hard. I don't know if it's just uh, something other people have an issue with. Yeah, I um, mean, you know, I'll let other people take this also. I guess my, my quick statement is, is, is a hard problem to solve, right? Because um, logging is actually very expensive. So for a proxy instance that may be doing like thousands of requests per second, um, logging will quickly become your bottleneck. And um, a real anti-pattern or failure in some of these software systems is that if you start logging a lot during failures, you'll blow it up even more. So the logging levels in Envoy are very purposeful actually to make sure that it never logs at high volume like really ever basically that has potential debugging issues and um, there's actually been a lot of work or you know thought that's been put in over time in terms of how to either make things um, a bit more obvious in terms of back off logging like only logging every so often or um, more information in logs or being able to turn on logs temporarily on a on a per request basis I think without knowing the specific issue <laughs> it's like it's hard it's such a complicated system that it's hard to say any one thing you know about what we could do but um, it can always be improved that's for sure I, I know I mean I know you have a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah, I think as, as Matt said earlier, a lot of the time, you know, we, we get improvements as the community wants it. So, you know, when, when Google joined, we basically took everything that we used for debugging GFE and ported it over to Envoy, right? And so that was a lot of like the response details for why is an individual request failing, um, adding more annotations, and these all go into access logs, not the, you know, the standard error logs, um, you know, adding more verbose logging, adding the, um, the error logs. So when something unexpected happens, that automatically does a power of two back off you know, one, you know, log, log once, but don't overwhelm. So, so I think again, like, as we've encountered issues, we, you know, inevitably sometimes we'll have to do like our own custom builds to, with a little bit of extra sprinkled information. And then we try to upstream that. So, so I think in general, you know, a lot of people in the Envoy community will reach out for help with debug and we, we try to help them. I know that when I help people debug, I always end up upstreaming what I use to debug their, their situation. Or sometimes I'll, you know, add, you know, some way to dynamically turn things on and off. So, I, again, I haven't I haven't actually checked my email recently enough to seeing your particular issue, but um, that is another way people can give back. You know, as as you kind of struggle through this, is is making the the next person struggle a little bit less. And and sorry if we don't have the exact knobs for you today. Um, probably have time for one or two more questions. Any anything else? So I was going to suggest to the question about adding new protocol support that the this is something called Iraqi that has like a meta protocol. Do you know what I'm talking about? No? Okay. Um, well, anyway, I was just, uh, the reason I wanted to ask is if you had an opinion on it, it's these people have added like a filter that allows to do meta protocol definitions so you don't have to write new filters. Um, and I just thought I'd get your take on it, but if you haven't seen it, don't worry. Yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about. I don't think it's fully baked yet. So, right. It's like it's, I think what we told them is they're supposed to rewrite Dubbo on top of it. And then when that happens, maybe more baked. And I'm like, I think that's happening, but it's not. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the only thing that I would say there is that there's still going to be some C++ code that's required, less for sure, um, but there's still the burden around documentation and maintenance and all of that. But yes, I agree that that would make it make it easier. So um, I think we can do one more question and then we'll just be around if people want to want to ask anything. Any any other anything else? Oh, okay. Last question. Uh, yeah, in lack of other questions, what's your favorite bug you've had to fix in Envoy? Um, I don't even know. I that, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I would actually have to think about that. It's been many years, so I'm not sure that I could think of any one particular bug. I don't know. Is there a favorite bug of yours, Alyssa? Wa voila. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah, except you. Yeah, Alyssa 
has infinite buffering as her favorite thing. I call that more of a feature, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Like, I wish I could give you a, a good answer, but I don't. I don't really have one. I don't know. Lee Zin, do you have a favorite bug? No. No. Sorry. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, um, and we'll be around if people have any other questions.